and welcome to the ADHD Friendly Podcast. I'm Patty Blinderman. I'm a professionally certified ADHD coach with over 10 years experience, and I and several of my family members are impacted by ADHD. So my passion is finding ADHD friendly ways to thrive with ADHD, and I bring them here and share them with you and hope it does the same in your life. Today, I'm going to share a celebration related to one of my favorite hobbies, knitting. Then I have some ADHD friendly sleep tips I'm going to share, as well as my main topic, which is something I'm calling holiday tolerations. So I'm going to talk about what tolerations are and share some strategies to manage them and hopefully get a few checked off. And then I'll let you know what's coming up in the next episode. So you'll have um, something to hopefully keep your focus and intention on coming back to hear the next episode. So let's jump in with my celebration. Today, I am celebrating a knitting win. And my knitting win is the poncho I'm wearing. So I made this, I finished it last May and it took me a lot longer than I thought I started it last fall and got distracted and hit a few little bumps in the road, but I finished it up um, by asking for help and getting a lesson on a couple of things that I was not confident in. And I finished it in May, but it was, it wasn't cool enough to wear it anymore. So this is the first time I'm wearing it and I'm really, really pleased with how it turned out. And so it's very sparkly and it's a lot of fun, giving me a lot of good energy. So I just wanted to celebrate something that I was able to, um, persevere through and, get across the finish line, which is always a win because a lot of times we start things with ADHD, but we don't finish them all. So whenever I finish something, it's a win and it goes in my wins book, um, my expecto paternum journal, which I already added it to it. But in case um, you didn't check out that episode, just want to share my expecto paternum journal is what I call my visual success journal, where I capture pictures of wins. And I have a whole section called evidence I can finish things. And this poncho, which if I had flagged the page before, um, would have opened beautifully to that page. But since I didn't, and look how many pages, guys, I'm like flipping, flipping, flipping. Here I am. My uh, picture of me wearing it when I finished it up on June 9th. So I was wrong, not May. And June 9th, I finished it and it was just too warm to wear it, but it's in there and it just brings me joy every time I look at the picture and now I'm getting to wear it. So there's my celebration. So on to my ADHD friendly tip, and this is a sleep tip that came to me. I was reading an article um, written by someone at CNBC, and the article was on the number one, what they called sleep killer, and I'm quoting sleep killer, and the sleep killer that they say is the number one interrupter of getting good restorative sleep is rumination. Now, you may know that term, you may not know that term. Um, it's very prevalent in those of us with ADHD. So I'm going to share a couple of definitions. So a really general de definition of rumination is it's a deep or considered thought about something. Now, rumination can be positive thoughts or negative thoughts. It doesn't have to be negative, but more often than not, it is associated with negative patterns of thoughts. So I'm going to share this definition that I thought captured that really well. So rumination is the focused attention on the symptoms of one's distress and on the possible causes and consequences as opposed to its solutions. Focusing on the causes and consequences keeps us stuck in that thought pattern without a way out of it. And so I love that really clear, definitive focusing on what caused it or what's the consequence of it as opposed to what can I do about it? Um, and so the article shared a couple of tips that I'm going to just highlight here. So it, it shared that rumination leads to poor sleep because it keeps your mind aroused, especially in bed where it's dark and quiet. So there's not a lot of competition for its attention when you're in bed. That's kind of that, you know, really can be kind of boring and, and difficult to settle your brain and, and slow it down so you can transition to sleep. So anything that your brain catches on and thinks about that fires it up, is really going to work against you and ruminating. So thinking about something and just, you know, kind of swirling it around in that, I think of it as soup, like it's just in there swirling it. It's not doing you any good is going to fire up your brain and do the opposite of settling it in and letting you transition to sleep. So they share two tips. The first they called worry early. So literally setting aside 15 minutes for alone time, perhaps in the, um, 
early or mid afternoon where you can, you know, kind of find a place where you're not going to be distracted, put away any devices that might distract you, make sure you're in a place that people won't distract you. So whether it's a, a private room, um, go for a walk, you know, something that that's going to allow you to have that time to think through um, and set a timer. So don't let yourself kind of slip into unintentionally into rumination. So setting a timer and go through your list of worries. So you're literally putting your worries into this time block so that you're giving your brain a place to kind of earmark like, okay, I'll think about this during my afternoon worry time. Um, and then just, you know, go through that process of thinking through the thing that would potentially keep you up at night. And you're, so you're doing it early enough in the day that you're giving yourself a chance to process it. So your brain isn't trying to figure it out when you're just starting to relax and try to go to sleep. And then the second I feel like builds on that. And that's to practice what they're calling constructive worrying. So maybe making um, a list of what the problem is on one side and what the solutions could be on the other side. So that really gets to the heart of rumination, not just focusing on the causes and consequences, but what, what could some solutions be? So an example of something that I was ruminating about this week was I wasn't getting a response to um, an email I had sent out inquiring about something that I had um, applied for. And I had follow up multiple times. I wasn't even getting a reply, let alone like, oh, we're so sorry. We haven't had a chance to do that yet. I was crickets, nothing. And so in my head, I was really ruminating about what was that about? What am I going to do if I don't hear from them? What do I have to do to you know, reach somebody that will respond to me? And so what I did was I, I tried this approach and I really, you know, wrote it down and then on the other side, I wrote solutions and I decided that I could follow up on Wednesday because it was Monday that I was processing this on Monday of the you know first day of the week. And I got up and I realized I still didn't have a reply after I'd sent something on Friday. And then I decided that if I followed up again and nothing happened by Friday, I could look for another contact. I could, you know, kind of block out a couple of minutes on Friday and, um, reach out to a few other colleagues and ask if they had a different contact that I could use. So again, it gave me constructive action steps that I could put in place, which allowed me to settle my brain and not fixate on it. And it definitely worked. I was not thinking about this at night. And what I notice is whenever we're ruminating, especially when you think about it at night, we're low energy. So our brain is getting fired up by it, but we're not able to shift into that um, problem solving mode. We're just swirling in it. So scheduling time to think it over and you know really identifying those things that you might ruminate about at night and giving yourself a chance to build time in to tackle it. I personally don't like the term worry time. I'm kind of playing around with what else I might call it because that just doesn't resonate with me. So like anything that I share if it doesn't resonate with you, maybe there's a piece of it that you could take and use. So I invite you just to explore if you like some part of that, how would you use it to support your brain to do less ruminating at night so that it's not your number one sleep killer? You're able to transition to sleep because you took care of the thing that you would have been ruminating about earlier in the day. All right, on to our main topic for today, and that's holiday tolerations. So as a reminder, tolerations are anything that drain your energy. So they can be things that you put up with, like a squeaky door or a broken cabinet that doesn't, you know, close or, you know, clothes that fit tight um, or things that distract you from focusing. Like, you know, they all those things can distract you too, but it could also be that you're tolerating, um, maybe you have some pain in your elbow and that's distracting you from focusing so it's pulling your attention, but you're tolerating it. Um, there are tolerations that we can do something about, and there's tolerations we have to figure out how to tolerate them where they're easier to tolerate. So we're not being as depleted in our energy resources. So when I think about tolerations, it comes up really vibrantly in the holiday season because things that I might be able to tolerate during the non-holiday season tend to get amplified this time of year. And so that could be maybe some things around your house that you've been meaning to get to, maybe a, you know, a couple of areas of clutter or maybe some home maintenance that you've been able to tolerate. But when you think about family or friends coming to visit for the holidays, it becomes more uncomfortable and drains you more because you've been meaning to do that. Or maybe the last time they visited, 
that was the case and you still haven't gotten around to getting it checked off. So that, you know, kind of creates more urgency and more drain. Um, so the strategy to deal with this is to first make a list of your holiday tolerations. So I'm just going to run down categories that you might explore what your tolerations are, but listing everything that you're currently tolerating is a great way, again, to get out of your head and into a list and like the sleep strategy. So you can come up with a plan for what can you do about it instead of just swirling around and maybe even ending up ruminating about that while you're trying to sleep. So to make a list, so get a sheet of paper, pen, sit down, and I'm going to go over some different categories. And I just invite you to, you know, notice which ones of these you're currently tolerating and what other ones you would add to the list if they're not included in my prompts. So the first is maybe you're tolerating something around family and friends. So that could be um, family members that create more of a situation that you're tolerating them because they're maybe they talk about things that make you uncomfortable or they're maybe they're critical of you and they um, aren't very good at keeping their thoughts to themselves. Or maybe it's tolerating the loss of a friend or family member that won't be able to be with you either because of um, circumstances that don't allow it with maybe not being able to get vacation or airfare being so expensive, or maybe you've lost a loved one this year. Like I have. So for me this year, I'm, um, having my father passed away in February. So I am entering my first holiday season, um, ah, without him. So that's a toleration. Um, second category is money. So when you think about money, it could be, um, the current state of inflation and how much that's impacting. Maybe you have, you know, same amount of money you had last year, but you, it won't go as far. And that's something you're, you're noticing you're tolerating, or maybe, you know, not having a budget or having a clear sense of how to make sure maybe, you know, in the past you've overspent during the holidays and you really want to rein it in, but you're not quite sure how to do that. Um, and that's something that you're tolerating. You've been anticipating that you're going to be tolerating. Um, maybe another category could be social. Um, things that you're tolerating. So it could be different social commitments like holiday parties and gatherings, um, maybe you know social expectations on your time. This comes up again a lot with families where um, maybe you know there's in-law situations or step families and or just you know certain family members that want you to come and see them and the, the other side of the family wants you to go see them or you know there's all those different dynamics that come up around the holidays and families that can be really challenging to navigate. Um, or maybe it's just the time that all of the gatherings take. Um, I know when we were little, we always went to visit family um, on Christmas day and we would drive two and a half hours to whatever family member was, was hosting and then two and a half hours back. And it was always a really busy day. As a kid, I loved it, but I imagine for my parents, that was really tiring. Um, so the time that holiday celebrations can take, and then maybe even it's just the noise. Um, when I think about, you know, gatherings with lots of people, that's always one of the questions I ask is, you know, about how many people do you, do you expect? If it's a lot of people, I'm not all that interested in going because I know how much energy it's going to take. And typically I, I don't enjoy it because the noise is just so, um, it's such an obstacle for me. If it's a quiet gathering of six to eight, that sounds lovely. But if it's a, you know, gathering of 30 to 50 people, <laughs> I don't know, that would, that would make me really have to think about that. Um, maybe it's when you think about gifts and this is somewhere that perfectionism can come in. So deciding the perfect gift, remembering who to buy gifts for. So remember, go back to the list that, um, you're getting it out of your head and writing down everybody you intend to buy for. Um, maybe it's, you know, the expectation that, you know, somebody's hard to buy for and, um, how do you pick something and tolerating the response? If it's not what you are anticipating, that's going to require energy. Another thing that comes up a lot during the holidays that we can tolerate is feeling lonely. So if you don't have family and friends nearby that you can easily visit, um, finding ways to tolerate that, finding ways to connect, whether you know it's through being active in other ways. We'll get to the strategies in a minute, but just identifying if that's something that you know is a toleration for you. Um, another I hinted, hinted at before is managing expectations. So it could be your own expectations. It could be family members, expectations, friends, that kind of thing, whether they're external expectations or expectations of yourself, just keeping in mind, managing expectations takes energy. It's a toleration. It could be your physical 
toleration. So I mentioned before, like maybe you have like a sore elbow or a sore knee. Um, you could be tolerating your weight and going into the holiday season if that's a time that you typically in, enjoy more, like for me, baked goods. So I always try to, you know, have a couple of pounds that I can, you know, kind of go into it. Um, with a little padding. So padding, meaning I can put on a couple of pounds and still, you know, not feel like it's too much where now I'm not going to fit into my clothes. But if I'm already at that maximum weight, that would be a toleration that, oh, am I going to still be able to enjoy the baked goods? And that would be a big toleration for me because I enjoy the holiday baked goods so much. Um, maybe stress is something that you're tolerating. So just the level of um, stress in your life that is already draining you. And then the stress over the holidays and the end of the year um, compounding that. And last, um, from my list, and again, you might have more, but just some prompts to help you think about as you're making a list of all the things you're tolerating, um, any changes to your routine can be toleration. So even if you think about changing up your environment, so maybe you know decorating can be nice, but then things are moved around and they're different places. And that takes more energy for you to tolerate because you have to keep remembering where you put things that you know, aren't in the same home that they were before because you put out the Christmas tree and you had to move everything or whatever it is. All right. So I just have, if you're listening to my podcast, I have a couple of pictures of quick things that to me always signify tolerations. So I have a picture of a, a broken shutter. I have a picture of a scale that somebody standing on and it just says help. And for me, this is always a toleration. Um, my Christmas trees, I like to get live trees. They always drop needles. I am literally, I just found needles this past weekend when I was vacuuming again. I don't know what they do. I don't know how they hide, but they stay. I can almost always still find a stray needle or, or two that will come out of nowhere throughout the rest of the year. So the needles is always a toleration for me. Um, so how do we do tolerations? How do we manage them with a little bit more ease so they're not as draining? So I'm calling this the the eight D's strategies. So there's you know six D's to time management, and and some of them are very similar, but I'm calling these the six D's or that I'm sorry the eight D's to tolerating um, managing toleration. So when you look at your list, maybe explore how one of these D's could support you to define the next action or get it crossed off your list. So ideally we're crossing them off just to, you know, automatically build up energy. So my quickest example here is if you have a light bulb that's been out and every time you go into the room and you turn on the light switch and it's out and it's like, oh, I really need to change that light bulb. Well, maybe you just go do it. If it's, you know, something that takes a minute or two, just going and doing it and crossing it off your list can automatically build up your energy. Because remember, tolerations drain your energy. So getting them crossed off will build your energy because they're no longer requiring your energy to tolerate them. A lot of times when I clean up an area that's cluttered, I may not have even noticed it was draining me anymore because I've become so it, just used to that level of, of drag in my energy from tolerating it. And then when it's gone, I think of this a lot, like if I have like a pile of things I need to donate. And they're just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And finally, I take them in the car and I go and I donate them. And I come back and that space is clear. It's like, oh my gosh, I had no idea that that was draining me so much. So sometimes, you know, just the, the quick win, if it takes a minute or two, just do it. And if you can't do it right now, but it is something that you can do, identify when, when could you do it? And so I do these like in a, in a spreadsheet, you guys know, if you listen to my podcast, I love spreadsheets. So I'll have all of the tolerations down and then I'll have eight categories and I'll put a check marks next to, okay, I can do this. When can I do it? And I'm going to schedule it if I can't do it right then. The next D is delete it. Maybe you're just going to decide, you know what, this isn't something I'm going to even think about. So it could be something that you have on your list of things you'd like to do, but it isn't something that you really care about when you really get down to it. There's other things that now you can see are a bigger priority. So you're just going to let go of it and delete it and just take it off your list completely. So just decide, you know, like for me, like I organized pictures this year and it's just been a huge project. And there's some parts of that that I have completely removed from my list because I realized I don't have the time, energy or interest to do that. And it might come around at some point in a year or two. But it may never, but I took it off my list. So it was no longer draining me to have it on my list. So delete it is another option with a D. Third is to divide it. So it might be that, let's say it's, you know, organize the garage or organize the basement or, you know, the, the walk-in closet or some area that feels overwhelming. If it's too big of a project to do at one time, maybe you divide it into just collect the trash or just, you know, take the initial boxes that are meant to be donated um, and drop them off. 
so that they are out of the way, but divide it into steps so that you have a way to move forward instead of expecting it all to be done at one time. Because then we find ourselves looking for that perfect block of time and that perfect time doesn't exist. So just divide it into sections and, and then do it or delegate. That's the fourth D, delegate. So maybe everything on your list doesn't have to be done by you. Maybe there are certain things on your list that would be better served um, getting it off your list and giving it to someone else. So um, uh, example might be you keep meaning to clean up the gutters of your house and it's like, yeah, okay, I got, I know there's leaves in there in the fall and I need to get them out before it starts to snow or, or whatever. But maybe it's just easier to outsource that and delegate it to a company that can come out and clean them out really quickly and has all the equipment to do it and cleans up the mess after the leaves are, you know, emptied out of the gutters and, and then it's done. So, um, delegate is the fourth D. The fifth one is assign a due date. So when, as I talked about before, if you can't do it now, decide when. So put a due date on it and then add a prompt. Because again, this isn't part of your regular routine. So if you decide, okay, I am going to actually do the gutters and it's really supposed to be very nice outside this weekend. So I'm going to put a reminder on the calendar to do it this weekend so that I don't just kind of reach Monday morning and realize, oh, I never did the gutters. So I always say, what prompt will you need to remember your plan? The sixth D is just to deal with it or accept it. So there are some things that maybe we can't cross off. So maybe if you have like a, a chronic illness and you're managing it the best that you can, but you can't do anything about, you know, just completely getting rid of it. It's something you're going to have to tolerate. So figuring out what's going to make that easier, whether it's, you know, really maybe structuring your sleep. So you're getting more restorative sleep um, or, you know, adding some support. So you're outsourcing some things that are harder for you to do. If there's a physical challenge that would make that, that task really draining, maybe you're looking to get some support in other areas to make it easier for you to tolerate something if you can't cross it off so you can deal with it and accept it with more ease. So it's not as draining to you. The seventh D is to discuss it. This is one of my favorites when I, when I did my list. So I, I'm going to hold this up. If you're listening to this again, um, check out my YouTube channel, ADHD friendly podcast. I literally just make a list and then I just do check marks. And what I was really surprised at when I did this exercise, um, to prepare for this podcast, I have most of my check marks in discuss and discuss means I'm going to talk about it with someone. So when I talked about the, the feeling that I'm going to be dealing with this year with, with my dad not being here, um, I can discuss that with people who get it, but you know, I'm, I'm going to have to deal with it because I can't change it. So figuring out how to deal with it more easily for me is talking about it. So I just invite you to think about, um, you know, what are, what are some things that you could maybe come up with a solution or a better approach to if you discussed it. And a lot of times tolerations around family members could do, could be that, you know, we're anticipating a toleration that will come up because we know it's our pattern when we're around certain family or friends and maybe talking about that in advance and flagging it as, as something that, you know, this has come up before and, and it's really hard for me. And maybe they have no idea how much it's impacting you. And, and they wouldn't have a way of knowing that unless we talk about it. So discussing it is one of my favorite strategies and the one that really solved the most of my tolerations um, when I went down my list. And then the number eight one, which I think is one of the most powerful ones is decline. And that means just say no. So a lot of times we'll tolerate things because we'll overcommit. Um, we'll say yes to things that we don't know how to say no in the moment. So then we're tolerating the additional expectation on our time, our energy, our resources. And by simply declining things where we can, it can literally free up all of those resources so that we have the energy to manage the other tolerations that we are holding on to because we have to deal with them or we can't cross them off quite yet. Or, you know, we, we are still working on how to get them crossed off. The more tolerations you can cross off, the more energy that you're going to have going into the holiday season, the more room you're going to have for enjoyment. So remember the, the eight D's to managing your holiday tolerations. And I just invite you make your list, check them off with your approach using the eight D's and then let me know how it went. Cause I'm always curious to hear what strategies really worked for, 
for you in, in managing your tolerations. All right. So to recap, I shared a knitting celebration with my knitted poncho. I also then shared an ADHD friendly sleep tip to support ruminating when you're trying to sleep. So you're doing that less by defining a time to worry and identifying some actions. So you're not staying in that place where you're focusing on the causes and the consequences, you're moving into the solutions. And then we talked about how to manage holiday tolerations using the eight D's. And next week, it is that time of year again. I am going to be doing my annual ADHD friendly favorite things podcast. I have 22 things on my list this year for my 22 and 22 list. It was one of my lists. I've been collecting them all year. And they are things including some a lot of products, a few books, and a few podcasts that made my 2022 ADHD favorite things list. So come back next week and check out my favorite products and things that made the list. And also remember, if you haven't started your personal owner's manual yet, now is the best time to do it. I have lots of resources on my website, ADHDfriendly.com for you to check out if you'd like to get started. There's lots of things on there to support you to do that. Until next time, tally ho.